Welcome to the Positive Spiritual Living Podcast, brought to you by Unity on the Bay. This is your positive path for spiritual living. So there's a little girl in a, in a Catholic elementary school. She's passing through the cafeteria line and she comes to a big basket filled with the most luscious, delicious looking apples. And there's a sign that has been placed by a teacher on those apples that says, take only one, God is watching. So the little girl takes one apple and puts it on her tray, and then she scoots down the line just a little bit further, and she comes to this wonderful platter filled with one of my favorites, chocolate chip cookies. And she sees wherein that one of her fellow students has placed a note above the cookies, and that note says, take all you want. God is busy watching the apples. (laughs) I love that joke because it reminds me of something. You know, the, um, the dichotomy in our minds between the God that we have been educated to believe in and that God for many of us was a God that was watching over us. I call it the Santa Claus God. And I call it the Santa Claus God because, as you know, with Santa Claus, if you've been very good, you get a reward. But if you have been very bad, you get coal. And who can do anything with a lousy piece of coal. And that's oftentimes, I believe, the way that we have, even to this day, though we've learned different definitions of God, we still are wondering, is God watching the apples? And if God is watching the apples, is God watching the cookies? And we watch our every move because we're concerned about the wrath of God in one way or another. This even translates metaphysically into karma. We have to watch everything we're doing because there's something that's lurking around the corner that's going to pay us back, that's going to punish us for every wrong move we make. Let me tell you right now in this room this morning, my dear Unity family, God is watching over you. God is watching over the apples and the chocolate chip cookies, but only for one reason, and that is to bless you, to affirm over and over again the love that God has for you, the care that God has for you that is far beyond anything that this world can ever offer you. There is not a person on this planet, no matter how much you love them, that is going to be able to provide for you like the presence and the power of God. In Scripture, we read these words, Luke 12, uh, chapter 32nd verse, Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Friends, God is not watching the apples so that he can or she can specifically observe how selfish or greedy or hungry you are. God is watching over the apples because God wants you to have all the apples you desire. It is the Father's, it is God's good pleasure, Father, Mother, God, to give you the kingdom. I want you to hear that. Like, God is ready, waiting, and poised. In spiritual reality, God's already given you the kingdom. So people come to me continuously when I say that, and it's like, huh, it doesn't feel like the kingdom of God to me. I don't feel like God's good pleasure is giving me any kingdom at all. I don't experience that. And I say this, well, there is a prerequisite for all of us, and that is that God cannot give you anything that you are not willing to receive. Do you hear me on this? And if you're holding some lousy self-image of yourself as undeserving and unworthy and made of mere mortal flesh, it's not going to be possible for you to receive this great riches that your father, mother, God is It's already placed right before you. So the key is to become receptive to this. And I'm going to be sharing with you this morning and next week some of my personal spiritual practices that have supported me in becoming more receptive. Now, these practices might work for you. I hope they do, or I wouldn't be up here expounding on them. But ultimately, it doesn't matter whether you like them or not. I'm encouraging you to find some spiritual practices of your own that you can begin to employ on a regular basis 
to place yourself in a position of being able to be receptive, that is aware of what your benevolent, all-loving Father, Mother God has already placed in front of you. And I'm not asking you this morning to do this for yourself personally. I'm not asking for you to do this to benefit your personal life. I'm asking you to do this because, as we have seen so clearly over the past few days, the consciousness of humanity must change. It must change. We must discipline ourselves to embody, that is to receive, that which God has given us so that we may lay down the foolishness of mortal ways the foolishness of judgment and condemnation and persecution and prejudice. If this is going to change, my friends, it will not change by us, as we like to say, fighting fire with fire. It will change because we change. Gandhi told us, you must be the change you wish to see. You must become the anchors and the pillars of God's love in the world. Unconditional love that transcends all human judgment. No one else can do this for you. And it will not happen in the collective whole until it happens in you and me. Until we lay down our personal judgment, our personal prejudice. And let me tell you right now that whether it has to do with the color of your skin or anything else... Right now, we all have a little pocket of prejudice in us. And we are asking this morning to be able to receive a conscious awareness of the kingdom of God to allow that prejudice to be wiped away, whatever it may be. So these spiritual practices are being offered. Yes, I'll take a breath and calm down a little bit. <laughs> yes, they are being offered for you to benefit your personal life. But it's bigger than that, my friends. We have a family of humanity here. And we must lay down our childish ways and begin to recognize that we are all made in the image and the likeness of the divine. All righty. These teachings are very important right now, my friends. We are receiving, on the level of appearances, tragic wake-up calls. And nobody needs to be woke up this morning short of us. And I speak for myself. All right, my first most powerful personal practice that can help us to become receptive, change ourselves, and thus change the world is this. Get to know your God. Get to know your God. How many of you have friends that sh whenever they contact you, though it may take a while to get to the point where you realize it, they always reach out to you because they want something. I have friends that I just know that if the phone is ringing and the caller ID says it's this person, I love this person, and I would do anything for them probably, but I know at some point along the way I might hear about all the adventures of their life, but before that conversation ends, they're going to ask me for something. That's not the kind of getting to know God that I'm talking about. We've been conditioned to believe that the most important time to go to God is when you need something. Dear God, on bended knee, you know, now I really need something, so please show up because, and it's like I wonder sometimes if God isn't going, oh, well, you know, I love you and uh, I'll do whatever you ask, but uh, would you ever just like to come and hang out with me for a while? You have friends that are in your company just because they want to be blessed by you, right? And isn't that great? They just want to commune with you. They want to hang out with you. And I believe that's the kind of relationship we need to be developing with God. For one thing, my friends, if you want a friend who's true and blue, you can't just go to them knocking at their door when you want something. You have to develop a relationship with them. And that relationship in itself will lead you to a place where they will be there when you need them. I love the quotation from Joel Goldsmith in his book, The Heart of Mysticism. He says this, each day you must have at least one period of meditation devoid of any problem concerning your own personal life for the sole purpose of experiencing in consciousness a communion with God. I'm hanging out with you because I want the companionship, I want the company, I want the communion, I love being in your company. 
Now, when you make this appointment with God devoid of any personal problems or issues or requests, remember that God is not separate from you. Now, even though I was raised in unity and I've known this reality for years, I still find myself at times putting God somewhere. I'm not even sure where I have God sometimes, but it's not in me. So remember that when you're experiencing this communion, you're not experiencing it with somebody or something that's outside of you. You are experiencing it with an aspect of your own true identity that lives within you. So this is a very internal communion. You are seeking to commune with the spiritual reality of your identity as an aspect and a beautiful aspect of the presence of God. The next um, practice that I want to share with you is the practice of being mindful of how you are defining yourself. And you have to be really honest because I know you're going to tell me right now in this room, well, I define myself as God's perfect child. But when you're out there in the world from day to day, is that really the identity? Is that really the definition that you're connecting to? Byron Katie who is going to be with us in September, Pamela was just mentioning that to us, um, has given us some wonderful um, revelations, inspirations around this importance of understanding the identity that we accept for ourselves. She says this, I am whatever I believe myself to be. And I tell you this morning, my friends, you are right now and always will be and always have been exactly whatever you believe yourself to be. So it behooves us as a spiritual practice to look at the definitions that we've accepted for ourselves, especially in those moments of concern or despair. Because I guarantee you the world will always reflect the identity that you have accepted for yourself. And if you feel you are unworthy or undeserving, then what you're going to find is the world will give you opportunities to demonstrate that, your unworthiness. Other people will treat you from that perspective, unworthy, undeserving. And the moment that you change that, you become mindful, and this is difficult to do in those moments of desperation, but you have to check in and say, who am I defining myself to be in this situation? Because I guarantee you, if there's trouble out here, it's only because there is some aspect of your own internal definition of yourself that is calling for you to change, to look at that. So if somebody treats you like you're unworthy, go deep within. Use that as an opportunity. As opposed to getting defensive, go deep within and say, what aspect of my identity is expressing here, and is it possible for me to let this go, to expand beyond it, and to rise up into the spiritual truth of who I am, which is perfect, happy, healthy, whole, free, exactly, as God has created me to be. Now, it's not always easy to change your perception of things. I had an opportunity just uh, Friday evening. I had some wonderful friends from Unity on the Bay over to my apartment across the street. And some of you know that I moved into this apartment. It really was a God thing because my mother was ill and she lived in that building and I wanted to be close to her, but I didn't exactly want to live under the same roof with her. Um, Love her dearly, but also really appreciate space. So um, I had the opportunity to move into the building. It was a very quick decision. And so I didn't have much time to think about it. And my mother called and said, well, they have this apartment here. So I went to look at it. And it was like, this would work. And then I stepped out onto the balcony and there was the city in front of me. It's ironic that I live in a bayfront building and I don't see water anywhere. I see the city. And if I look down a little bit, I see the whole campus of Unity on the Bay, and I knew, well, that's one reason why I'm here is to every morning, every evening, bless Unity on the Bay, bless the campus, because we've been going through this property transition, and I thought this will be perfect. But there has been within me this little tiny bit of resentment that all these people, hundreds of people, live in this building, and all of us except those of us that have balconies that for some unexplainable reason were put onto the west side of the building instead of the north side of the building, even though they easily could have been accommodated on the north side of the building, we don't get to see the water. So sometimes I'm thinking, eh, all I see is the hustle and the bustle of the traffic going back and forth, back and forth, the horns honking, the buildings going up all around me, construction, you know, uh, the greediness of humanity. That's the way I often looked at it. And so I would transcend that because I'm so spiritual, you know. 
I would transcend that and I would just look beyond it. But something happened to me Friday night before my guests arrived. I went out onto the balcony and I looked at the city. And I was thinking about the talk I'm giving you this morning. And I thought, you know what? This looks the way it looks to me because of the definition that I am accepting for what I am seeing. And what I am seeing is traffic and congestion and greed through uh, an infinite number of high rises that are springing up all around. I can change that. And so what I did was I asked in that moment, I said, I'd like to have a different translation of this. Number one, I'd like to not resent the people who can see the water because that's a wonderful blessing. And I'd like to know why I'm here looking at the city all the time. And what came to me immediately was you are not looking at a city. You are looking at the evolution of humanity. And it is brilliant and it is miraculous and it is beautiful. Now, my friends, when I step out on my balcony, I feel sorry for the people that have to look at the water. (laughs) Because I'm looking at the majesty of God before my eyes. Every power line, every horn honking, every car that's backed up in traffic and every new high rise that is springing up. It's all part of the evolution of humanity. So people say, what's your view like? I say, every morning now, I get to view the evolution of humanity. And they go, well, we're not sure what that means, but it sounds pretty cool. (laughs) So you see, all I did was change my mind. I changed the definition. You can change the definition about yourself and about anything in your world, and there are a few things happening right now, locally, nationally, and internationally, that are requiring a change of definition on our part. If we are acting out of an inaccurate definition and we do not see the hand of God in everything, then our actions will be born out of the wrong inspiration. They will be born out of trying to fix a troubled, darkening situation instead of recognizing this is the activity of God. I can play a part in it. I can define it as I choose, and I can see it as an opportunity to take something that has been going on drip feed in the collective consciousness of our country and of our world, drip feed a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and bring it into full focus, you see. You can't miss it. Now you can see clearly the situation. You can define it as you choose to define it. For me, an aspect of the evolution of humanity, and then you can do something about it that is coming from a place of the true self that you are. That is an identity of peace and prosperity and poise and love and goodness. Next, verify your vision. I love these words of Carl Jung. Your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Who looks outside dreams? Who looks inside awakes? There's a wonderful formula that's been given to us by Michael Bernard Beckwith, who is the minister of the Agape International Spiritual Center in Los Angeles. And he says that the way to discern the vision for your life, getting into the practice of discerning and evolving the vision for your life, is to first of all close your eyes for just a moment and ask God what God's vision for your life is. And that's really what you want. Remembering again that God is a higher dimension of yourself. What is God's vision for your life? And then ask the question, what is it that might be standing in the way of that vision for you? What is it that you might be ready to release? What is it that you might be able to embrace in order to take you toward your vision, your God vision for your life? And then finally, what are the gifts that you and you alone have that can help bring that vision into manifestation? Look within. Don't go looking out here for the vision of your life. I've told you before, but I'm going to say again this morning, the most important thing you can ever do is go within, discern God's vision for your life, and keep it in your face at all times. Visions are magnetic, and they will automatically draw people, circumstances, and opportunities to you that will allow you to demonstrate that vision, to become that vision. And a vision is always just a little bit more than you think it is. We have a vision here at Unity on the Bay. Who can tell me what it is? Not everybody at once. (laughs) 
Jason, can you throw it on the screen so we can remind everybody of the vision that we collectively hold? Humanity inspired to its divinity. Now, that might be a vision that we never quite completely attain, but that's okay with visions. Visions should always be just a little bit beyond that which you believe yourself to be able to attain or that which you might be actually expressing in this moment. Here at Unity on the Bay, our vision is to see all of humanity inspired by God to the realization and the recognition of our true identity, our divinity. So take a few moments to come up with a vision statement, very powerful, and let that vision statement stay in front of your face so that it can guide you along the adventures of your life experience. And finally, this is a big one, so take a deep breath with me. (sighs) Jesus, you might recall, gave us beautiful but sometimes difficult instructions. And one of the instructions he gave us was to love our enemies and pray for our persecutors. Now, true confessions this morning, I have some people that I have interpreted in my life as persecutors, as enemies. And there was a time in my life when I would approach those individuals with anger, with resentment, with hostility, because I believed that they had wronged me. I'm moving along in my spiritual practice to begin to get to the point where when a person shows up as my enemy, I can begin to recognize that they are actually not my enemy, that they are in some way, somehow in my life to share something with me, to show me something. So the final practice for this morning is to love and pray for your enemies and also to thank them to thank them for whatever it is that they are bringing into your experience that might contribute to your illumination as a spiritual being. Oprah Winfrey says this, and it's a mouthful. Are you ready? True forgiveness is when you can say, thank you for that experience. Not always easy to do. But again, my friends, what we're about the business of doing here is redefining ourselves. It's not difficult for a child of God to thank anyone. It's not difficult for a child of God to love anyone. So we're back to step number one. How are we really defining ourselves in this situation? How are we defining our world? And right now, my friends, I say this to you from the deepest place of my heart. The only way that the pain and the sorrow and the challenge, and the persecution, and the war that human beings have struck upon one another is to accept for ourselves a new way of being. You cannot play by the old rules and move forward. You cannot play by the old rules and see the family of humanity liberated. You cannot play by the old rules and break free of the confines of judgment, persecution, and prejudice. The only way to do this is to redefine what is going on here, to see it all in some strange and perplexing way at times as the hand of God reaching out to us saying, it is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Receive it. God bless you. Time for our prosperity opportunity. You know, um, my good friend, a former minister of uh, Unity in Fort Myers, Jim Rosemurgy, he and I worked together for about a decade at Unity Village. And he says this, most people believe that prosperity is demonstrated by receiving. In other words, you have a prosperity demonstration when you receive something, you get something, unexpected income, the right job. Most people think that that's what prosperity demonstration is. He says, no, prosperity demonstration doesn't have anything to do with what you get. Prosperity's demonstration is found in what you give and the spirit and the heart from which you give it. You're demonstrating prosperity when you give whatever you have to give to life. And people say to me, well, I don't have anything to give. Look again. There's a smile on your face that is a possibility for every one of us. And sometimes that's all somebody needs to see. 
your generosity in life, both in terms of your giving here at Unity on the Bay to support this amazing spiritual community and your generosity in terms of never knowing what the person walking down the street might need from you, give them what you can and know that you always have something you can give. Then you'll demonstrate prosperity, and as you give, you shall... Well, you got that one right. As our ushers come forward, I remind you that you have the power to bless. And so we want to bless this gift as we give it this morning, holding it within our hands, but knowing that it is a symbol of something we hold in our hearts, infinite, invisible substance, as together we affirm our offertory statement. Divine love that I am blesses all that I give and all that I receive. Thank you, God. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Positive Spiritual Living Podcast, brought to you by Unity on the Bay, a spiritual community located in Miami, Florida. Unity on the Bay is supported by the generosity of its community. If you'd like to make a donation or learn more about Unity on the Bay, please visit unityonthebay.org. You can also follow Unity on the Bay on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for even more positive spiritual inspiration. Until next time, thanks for listening and many blessings. Namaste.